when I was a kid. Guys like me were brought up to follow codes. Hey, jerk off. What'd you say? What? Antonio Soprano. I wonder if I can talk to you alone for a moment, Mrs. Soprano. On the basis of the Sanford Binet, he's high IQ. You can't prove it by me. He's got a D plus average. Well, he doesn't apply himself, but he is smart. The results tell us he's a leader. Ankle dick. Growing up with the family takes a toll. Maybe an ambassador of England or France. You're my nephew. My life to gamble. I want to do whatever I can to help you. you may be a business man. My gift to you. I want to go to college. I can't get caught with shit like this. Look, you take the speakers, right? At the same time, you say to yourself, this is the last time I'm ever going to steal something. It's that simple. Let me go talk to him. He only listens to Dickie. Gotta do something about Dickie Malasani. As far as your nephew goes, I'm listening. Stay out of his life. Arriving October 1st in theaters and on HBO Max, New Line Cinema's The Many Saints of Newark is a feature film prequel to David Chase's influential HBO crime drama, The Sopranos. The movie was shot on location in New York and New Jersey, with a cast including Alessandro Nivola, Leslie Odom Jr., John Bernthal, Corey Stoll, Ray Liotta, and Vera Farmiga. The teenage Tony Soprano is played by Michael Gandolfini, son of James Gandolfini, the original Tony. Joining us in this episode are director of photography Kramer Morgenthau and production designer and Sopranos alum Bob Shaw. Shaw is an Emmy winner for Boardwalk Empire and Mad Men and received three additional nominations for his work on The Sopranos. He was also Oscar nominated for Martin Scorsese's The Irishman. Morgenthau is a six-time Emmy nominee whose credits include Game of Thrones, Boardwalk Empire, Thor The Dark World, Creed II, and recent release Respect. I'm Carolyn Giardino. Welcome to the Hollywood Reporter's Behind the Screen. Bob Kramer, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Congratulations. Thank you. (laughs) So Bob, for you, what was it like to return to the Sopranos world? It was less like returning to the Sopranos world than, than delving into, into the Sopranos history. There were names and characters that had always been sort of sprinkled through the dialogue in the series, uh, like Chicky Sasso. We always heard about Chicky Sasso getting shot. And um, so it, it was interesting to sort of take a little trip into the history that I knew a little bit about, but not everything. And Kramer, what was it like for you joining for me as a cinematographer, it was a dream project, you know, working on a 1960s gangster movie. Uh, you know, it's a dream come true. Uh, also, I felt a lot of weight because there were big shoes to fill because the show was uh, such a beautiful piece of work and such a piece of iconic, uh, you know, Americana at this point. So this was shot entirely in New York and New Jersey. Bob, why don't you start, tell us about uh, scouting and, you know, how you picked some of the key locations in this film. Well, it's interesting. We uh, first went and looked at the, the neighborhood in, uh, in Newark where things would have really taken place and found that it was a little too changed. And um, all of the houses were covered with vinyl siding and they all had replacement windows and uh, different uh alterations over time and we then started looking for neighborhoods that looked a little bit more like Newark would have looked and we found ourselves in the Bronx and um, partially I had done a film a couple of years ago where we shot almost all in the Bronx and there are certain neighborhoods that haven't changed they still have the same um, those metal awnings that are over top of the doors and windows you know uh, so they've been there in these neighborhoods in the Bronx for 50 years and no one's ever taken them down and uh, Newark was much more um single-family houses had been clearly altered and, and 
we took a little bit to convince David that we could not do it in New Jersey. But um, what wasn't New Jersey looked more like New Jersey at the time period. Did some of the work you did uh, researching for the Irishman help here? Um, you know, to a certain extent, and uh, to a certain certain extent, it was the same thing as the Irishman, where it happened to be territory that I was um, familiar with from from family background. I mean, I grew up in New Jersey, and I remember turning the local TV stations on, you know, uh, WPIX and WOR, and and seeing coverage of the of the riots when they were happening. And um, so I, uh, in, in both in both instances, I sort of relied on my 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 mother's Italian family background and uh, and my own New Jersey background. Kramer, what was the overall look that you talked about with the um, with, with your director and the filmmakers initially um, that you wanted to create? I think the overall look that uh, we were going for with Alan Taylor, our director, and. David Chase, um, creator of the show and the writer and a producer, was uh, something that um, was super cinematic uh, and at the same time honored uh, the original look of the show, um, but had maybe a more of a, a big screen, um, larger than life quality, uh, and yet at the same time staying immersive with these characters. Um, I, I didn't want it to feel like something like film noir. I wanted it to feel like something more like um, a naturalism um, that, uh, you know, that you actually are in these worlds. And, you know, we did deep research into, you know, photographic research into what uh, the North Ward, uh, which was the Italian neighborhood, uh, would have looked like at the time. And, you know, what, uh, what it would feel like to be in these row houses um, kind of the claustrophobia of that, uh, and you know, needing to get out of the so-called, you know, I don't know, Italian ghetto, for lack of a better word, um, and uh, and using a widescreen aspect ratio, which kind of allowed you know ensemble of all these amazing characters to kind of line up in a row, almost like a you know. Uh, some sort of Dutch master painting, um, that kind of thing. To what extent did the series influence your decisions? Although obviously it was a different period. Uh, photographically, um, and sort of as a filmmaker of the show, you know, had, had an influence. Um, there was a, you know, a deep dive into use of top light and sort of, you know, kind of, I think, a reference to Godfather 1 and 2 and Gordon Willis's work are kind of like the holy grail of any American gangster movie made after, you know, 1970. Um, and uh, so it's impossible not to be influenced by that work. Um, and, you know, heavy use of, of contrast and chiaroscuro and, um, but also a way of shooting characters where the, you shoot a two shot and you allow the two characters to play in the frame and not, you know, kind of a more modern approach where you're constantly cutting to close up to close up to, you know, coverage over, 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 and, you know, a more cutty approach. It's a much more staid and just allow people to, to breathe, you know, allow characters to breathe, allow the audience to breathe, allow people to take in Bob Shaw's beautiful production design and, and the costume design and and the environments that you're in. And the environment is almost as much of a character as as is the, the characters themselves. You know, it's like we're, we're visiting a world. We're visiting, you know, um, the origin story of where these guys, how these guys wound up in suburbia and um, and their, their urban roots. So um, there you have it. The wide ratio is like very important because uh, back at the time we were doing the show, certainly in the early years, there was a little bit of a of a struggle uh, to get permission to show it in a wide format. And in the first couple of seasons, it was always a uh, well, you can do it that way, but you have to protect for the normal TV aspect ratio, which would mean instead of having people at the far end of the frame, they one of them one of them in the middle anyway. 
But the show always uh, featured what I is called the Last Supper shot and these wide tableaus. And so once once uh, that struggle was finally won and we could just shoot in the wide aspect ratio, um, it, it, it became part of the style of the show. So the fact of doing that again with the with the um, with the with the film is, is very much stylistically, you know, Sopranos. Let's talk about some of the scenes. Um, let's start with the 1967 Newark riots. Bob, this was shot in Newark. Um, do you want to talk about how you selected the uh, uh, over the few blocks that you used for that set? When we decided to scout Newark, and we scouted some other cities in New Jersey, uh, the area we were in had the most concentrated number of, of storefronts that, that we could alter. Um, we weren't going to be able to find anything in, in the commercial world that had not changed in all this time. Um, but a lot of it was about control and there were three blocks that we could control and, um, stores that were willing for us to, you know, to be, to transform them and, and shut them down. And part of it was the, um, I forget the name of the deli that, that featured in a lot of shots. It was Hobby's Deli? Hobby's, yeah. Um, that was there and, and the old movie theater was there. So those were sort of the anchors, and then the, most of the rest of it was altered. Um, but it was act, altered in a practical way because there was so much um, action taking place, and fire, and smoke, and atmosphere that there was there was no way that it could be done anything other than practically. So control and having the, the ability to close somebody down for three weeks was important. And then I would imagine there was also a lot of post production work involved, not just in that but in, across the board to take out anything that was uh, more modern for the period? You know, I was, this was done a lot more practically than, than things I'd worked on, you know, of late, just because of uh, the smoke and the fire and, and so many people um, running in front of the stores. Um, some stuff higher up was altered, but, but down, on the, down on the street, everything really needed to be practical in this case. Shooting the Newark riots, uh was one of the great challenges of, uh, of shooting many scenes with Newark and we have so many different um, sort of takes on how to approach it and we just wanted to you know do it as sensitively as possible and not to glorify it or you know fetishize uh, the violence or the you know the rebellion is really what it was and uh, uh, we, you know, did a very deep dive into archival footage of the actual event, and um, and all the uh, and photojournalism around it, and uh, it's a very uh, careful study. And hopefully, you know, hopefully we got part of it right. Anyway, uh, we shot with Panavision uh, lenses, uh, which were T-series anamorphic lenses that were tuned. Uh, in such a way to kind of have a bit of a period uh, feeling to them, and we use Aeroflex large format cameras. And I believe you also did some uh, grain and manipulation in post production. Yeah, we used something called live grain, uh, which is a way that it, it's kind of scans of real film grain. Uh, we Peter Doyle, a colorist, uh, did a, a bunch of. Uh, Lookup table work to kind of do film emulation and that kind of thing. Kramer, tell us about your approach to lighting the actors. The lighting of the actors was a, a much more a, um, naturalistic approach I was taking than maybe some of the uh, other stuff I've done before, or even what you might expect in a uh, gangster type movie. Um, using a lot of top light, a lot of uh, kind of uh, directional, but more uh, subtler, uh, softer approach, and just something that would bring these characters to life um, and uh, kind of heighten some of the, the moments um, that, that would, we were uh, seeing them go through, some of the violence, some of the, you know, more... Um, emotional story points. Specifically, would you talk about lighting Michael Gandolfini? Uh, yeah, Michael, we wanted to, you know, light him in a certain way that made him look younger uh, in the, you know, when he first appears and then kind of as he 
kind of starts to find his uh, uh, his truth in the story, you know, give him a little bit more of a kind of tougher quality and uh, maybe sort of shaped him more and uh, let some of his uh, foreshadowing of who he's going to become as Tony Soprano come through later on. Let's talk about some of the other actors. Um, would you like to describe working with Vera Farmiga, who played Livia? Uh, Vera was really, uh, you know, an incredible uh, actor to work with. And uh, I remember I, you know, this was pre-COVID, and uh, I was able to, you know, bring my family to set. And my daughter, who was about four years old at the time, saw her lying in bed she's like what's she doing what's she doing in bed what's she what's she doing there and you know i said oh she's acting she's acting she said oh she's acting i, I want to be an actress i just it was it's kind of a maybe slightly off topic story but it was a um just a memory i i had of vera and she completely inhabited uh that role and was wearing a prosthetic nose to make her look more like the original Olivia, and um, she just kind of transformed into, you know, a whole other person that was just completely in that whole world, and uh, you, you couldn't, you know, you couldn't shake her out of it. She was like, uh, kind of went full on. What about working with uh, Corey Stroll as Junior? You know, again, a very serious actor, and had really obviously studied everything that Junior was, and. Um, he kind of felt like you were, you know, watching the same character 40 years in advance. Uh, it was really, uh, again, transformational. I mean, this cast is like, uh, you know, some of the great actors that are, that are out there today. Really uh, a pleasure. Bringing some of those iconic characters back at their younger ages must have been quite a challenge for all of you. Yeah, you know, it, it was, uh, we did a lot of tests with them and with their hair and their makeup and um, you know, the right glasses, Corey, and, you know, you know, part of what we do as cinematographers is help bring the characters to life. And, uh, you know, the great actors understand how much cinematography is a part of their characters, uh, portrayal. And they, uh, they love to get, uh, involved in the collaboration and really understand how light and the right angle and, um, you know, the right lens is uh, can make all the difference in how they're they're brought to the screen. Bob, in this film, you uh, you also had to create the uh, scene at Playland when Tony's father, Johnny Boy, is arrested. Would you talk about creating that setting since that was also uh, referenced in the series? It, it was referenced in the series. Um, it was smaller in scope in the series. Um, we went to Rye Playland um, because it's. Um, an amusement park, which really, uh, for the most part, is is old style and things are wooden and 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 it had and it had the right look. But we were able to give it a, a bigger scope than um, the, than that was done in the series, and uh, so we, we didn't feel compelled to try and recreate what had been in the series. We tried to do what was the best for for this script, sort of coming to a cold, as opposed to you know feeling the need we had to recreate the pork store, but not you know not feeling we had to recreate the, uh, the amusement park. And then you also have a scene set at Holson's, the restaurant where the final scene of the series takes place. Uh, would you talk about going back to that setting, which I believe is in Bloomfield, New Jersey? Yeah. Well, one thing that was handy was that the people who own Holston's have owned it for a long time, and they were able to provide us with some photographs of what it looked like back in the day, as they say, and the, the, the awnings that were on it and how the signage was different. So uh, it's the same location as in the, the last scene in the series, but it's, uh, it, it's how it looked uh, 30, 40 years ago. There were awnings in the front. There was signage in the front. I mean, we were looking at these pictures with magnifying glasses, literally trying to figure out what, what the objects in the window were. And so we really didn't do that, that much other than some changes of signage and, some, um, and, and the awnings that were there. Uh, awnings were a big thing at the time still, you know. Uh, and they didn't have these plastic awnings that they put on stores now. 
Kramer, do you want to talk about shooting that scene? I, uh, I, I mean, that the location in the uh, original obviously has become so iconic. Yeah, I mean, shooting the scene is a, you know, again, it's like taking a, a piece of uh, Americana and, uh, you know, having the honor of photographing it. it, it the, the, the restaurant itself, it's kind of stands alone. It, 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 it's a timepiece in the middle of a, a block in, New, in Bloomfield, New Jersey, that doesn't, nothing around it really feels like of the era. So when we looked out the window uh, at Tony, young Tony um, sort of standing there in this sort of lone figure silhouette looking out the window, nothing out there was really period correct. So we had to put a giant blue screen in one direction and then use a plate of a background from just maybe about just sort of half a block away that Bob had dressed and uh, the inside of the restaurant really felt like you were you were back in the 70s and um, there was kind of like layers of kind of texture that are there and then Bob who is a you know genius of many kinds but of, of detail and you know um, making sure everything in the shot is right that you could kind of Photographic, and it feel when you, as soon as you're pointing the camera, you feel like you're you're going back in time. It was kind of uh, it was magical, you know. I think the Silhouette Club was a real collaboration because we knew it was going to be very dimly lit, and there wouldn't be any reason to have like a lot of bright light in there. And something has changed so much since the era when we started The Sopranos. It's, you know, shooting digitally and, and and with the cameras, you you rely a lot more on on your practical lights and so we were building as many uh things into the set as we could in the, in the uh, performing area uh, where the singer was in, in the silhouette club we 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 added those sort of large round lights um to the ceiling and um we did some tests you know of of, of how of, of just what to make them out of to, to make sure that they were sort of had the right amount of presence and and were a graphic element but weren't too bright or too distracting and we built a lot of a, a lot of the lighting into into the set you know behind the little stage where the where the singer was and then in the room where they um, are eating the sheep's heads <laughs> in the back um again we, we we did as many little light tricks as we could to, to justify that something would be on for the scene um where uh, uh dickie goes back into the club looking for you know for his gun um and to, to be able to see, but be able to not have it be implausible. So I think that was one where we, we, we really had to c collaborate a lot on just how much we, how much light we needed and what kind of fixtures we wanted to achieve it with. Exterior and ex interior were two different places. They were both, it was funny because the, the location that was the Silhouette Club was actually the Danish Sports Club. Now, no one would even know that there was such a thing as a Danish Sports Club, but it was sort of a social club um, from an earlier era and, um, we liked the bar and the bar was a little piece of the right time period, but then we really had to change pretty much everything else. And at one point we were going to have split the, um, the front room where the entertainment was and the back room into two different places. And then we came up with a way to sort of build a set that connected to, so the front room was partially, uh, intact when we found it and then we added walls to it and then we added a whole set that was completely from scratch you know through the doorway built a set into a set into a location it's just like you, it's it's incredible like uh, you know i was like you're, you're what and it was just it all felt like it was you know actually part of what was there but it was like some of it was elements of a location some of it were set pieces then he built another room that you go into, and it was, you know, it's kind of, and they're like these incredibly low ceilings, and I have to do a scene in there with no light, you know, it's the lights of power has gone out because, you know, one of the characters has shut off the lights because they're chasing each other, and I'm like, Bob, how the, how do I light the darkness, and I, the ceilings are too low to hide movie lights, so we collaborated and built these round fixtures that look like they're supposed to be there and that can go from looking like tungsten lights to looking like kind of moonlightish stuff. And it was like a, 
it was a you know it was a great collaboration and then the outside was um we was chosen because we needed the outside to work for the action and 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 the shooting and the cars you know and all of that it just had nothing to do with where we were but it was a real I guess it was like a real club or was it a funeral home it was a germ it was a german club (laughs) we we were going to different older clubs in new york and it was in it was in it was in astoria or was it in um Uh, it was deep in brooklyn it it was in brooklyn Um, yeah and you know one thing about shooting in the outer boroughs and bob's genius is that he find you know that architecture in the outer boroughs of Manhattan uh, has not changed, you know, and it has to do with, you know, economics of these neighborhoods. They have not been gentrified. And he goes out and just drags uh, like a, you know, a fine tooth comb through all these neighborhoods and finds these gems that haven't changed. And, you know, we're, there was not a lot that needed to be changed. I mean, you changed the facade, but it was a real facade. And then the buildings around feel like you are in Newark in 1967 or, you know, whatever the exact date was. But it's like it's part of it is finding, you know, the architecture that's, you know, a diamond in the rough out there. The, the surrounding buildings drove the location choice more than the facade of the club. And um, Alan had some very specific blocking in mind. And we would get out and scout somewhere and Alan would go. You know, we'd wait for him to figure out whether the geometry worked for him. The storyboards, he had drawn storyboards, so we had to find locations. And Alan has this thing where he's with his fingers and his, he's kind of looking at where the characters line up and how the eye line and if it's going to fit in his location. And then he actually redrew the storyboards once you found that great location. It's, it's funny that when Alan goes to a location, you're looking around and it's like, where did he go? And you look and he's like, on top of a standing on top of a fence because he wants a high angle and it's like he hasn't killed himself yet or he's lying on the ground you know, <laughs> yeah, he's, like, like, he's like a billy goat and he's, he's like he's everywhere he's high he's low he's you know like, where, and, the, where do you go and he's like yeah he's up on a fire escape and, and it was your turn to watch him did the two of you feel um, a different type of pressure working on this project knowing that there were so many fans that have been you know dissecting and analyzing these characters and their story for decades. I mean, I didn't, I didn't feel any particular pressure um, because it's um, we're, we're dealing with different characters and the characters that are familiar to us are, are much younger. And um, to me, it was a good thing to, to, to revisit the show, but to revisit it many decades earlier. And uh, I think that kept it from being any kind of, 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 of pressure situation. And of course, we didn't write it, so you know, we're not responsible for what people what people are looking for. Yeah, yeah. I I felt a bit of pressure, but uh, not uh, uh, you know because it is such an important show, such a piece important piece of television, it's such an important piece of Americana, uh, it's an important piece of uh, you know, it's one of the first shows that had a great anti-hero. It's one of the first shows that kind of allowed uh, the arrival of peak television, as they call it, of the golden age of television. Um, it kind of put cable on the map, put HBO on the map. Um, it, uh, it, you know, it kind of caught the attention of, of you know, feature filmmakers that were like, "Wow, television! It can be like a feature film." So I, it was that was all in my mind. And then once we started shooting, I kind of just shut it all off and just, you know, we're making a film. And this is a film that stands alone. And as Bob said, it's a film that's from a completely different time period. And, uh, you know, we want to, you know, we want to do something that stands alone. So, Bob, in your production design, are there any, um, you know, subtle Easter eggs that you would point out for fans to watch for? You know, it's funny. Um people ask about that and there there's very little that was intentionally in in there but there i think it's on somewhere in the dining room there's a, a photograph of um of Livia um that we recreated a photograph that we had of, of Nancy Marchand from from the um the beginning of season 3 where we had Livia's funeral and um uh we sort of recreated that with uh with Vera and it's, it you'd really have to be looking to find it but it, it's there 
and uh, it's 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 a it's a duplicate wedding photo with Vera, who was so amazing. I mean, it was it's it's one thing to watch a, to watch a uh, something being filmed and to see scenes and bits and pieces and and not necessarily know how things are going to come together, but um, seeing the the finished film, it, it was just astounding how much she uh, brought Livia uh, to life and and how. It seems like this is exactly what Livia was like when she was younger. I mean, it, it was astonishing to me. I thought, she, I thought she really just did an amazing job. So that was interesting. I mean, how, you know, to get young Livia, it's kind of a, kind of amazing. You know, there, there's a scene. There were scenes that um, that had been referred to too. This the 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 scene where you know Johnny when they're in the convertible, the the, the firing the, the pistol. That that was that was referenced somewhere in the. Um, in the, uh, I think it was in the episode where they were at the lake house, but um, I, it, it was one of those things that I talked about, like you know, Chicky Sasso, and like he shot her right in the beehive hairdo, and, and those things that um, that that we that were littered through the scripts, and, and, and then they came to life. It was really kind of fun. Any recollections of any uh, conversations or directions with David Chase? One thing we decided very early on is I said, please, please, can we not do the plastic slip covers? Um, <laughs> And um, I think it was important to us to try and do real Italian American as opposed to cliche Italian American or um, that kind of cartoon or or that um, overly characterized, you know, caricaturized really. And um, that was some something that we definitely talked about was you know to avoid a lot of those cliches and look for other things that we know were real. I mean, there was a thing about um, because of my my Italian family on my mother's side, and then certain things that I remembered. But I would ask Regina to find things, and it's like, can you find one of those metal cake dishes that has a lock on it? <laughs> and she found one, and you know, certain kind of sugar bowl. And I, you know, I asked, I don't know that they would mean anything to anyone else, but there were certain things that made it um, made it uh, more Italian to me. I mean, funny things people would do, like um, to um, you put cookies in a tin, but to line the underside of the tin with aluminum foil so it sealed better when you when you put the lid on, and all these little funny things like that. That uh, and Regina, our decorator, uh, who's amazing, um, is from Harrison, New Jersey. And the other night we saw the we saw the uh, movie, and I said, "Well, th- thank you for another amazing job." And she said, uh, "This one, this one, I lived. <laughs> this one, I knew." <laughs> you know, she. You know, Harrison's the next town over from Newark, and. Uh, and she said, I knew this territory very, very well. Well, the only other thing I would say was that it, it, in addition to revisiting The Sopranos, it was great for me to revisit working with David Chase and working with Alan Taylor and working with Kramer. Because um, I, I had worked with Kramer on Boardwalk Empire and on Too Big to Fail, but not on anything so- Soprano related. And um, I think, uh, you know, it, it, it's great to work with people that you have a shorthand with and, and people that you... Uh, that you have trust in and, 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 uh, you know, sometimes there's sometimes there's almost an adversarial relationship between production designers and, and directors of photography. And you have to know that when someone says, I- I'm, I'm trying to help, I'm trying to support your work. I'm trying to help your work that supports Alan's work that supports David's vision. And, um, it was great to, to have all, all of that, like in the rear view mirror when we started and know that like, um, it's just great to, to work with Kramer. And it was, I mean, to me, the, being able to work with David again after all this time, because I hadn't been production designing as long as, as, as I have now when we started the show 20 years ago. And I wasn't the person who did, did it first. And, and David was already the famous creator of The Sopranos by the time I ever came into the show. And so I was always very intimidated. And um, so to sort of work with him again and, and not be afraid of him <laughs> was was kind of a treat and you know he's one of those people that you you know would would follow into battle anytime you know and and i hope he has some more some more uh, uh scripts up his sleeve because uh you know working with him was a dream and working with these guys was was just like a, a dream yeah i i have uh, i'd have to add in you know working with david chase uh it was uh, you know kind of Working with David Chase was like a, a great life experience for me. I, I know I was also intimidated uh, 
to first meet him and who is this man who created this amazing show is he you know as tough as Tony Soprano is there is a little bit of Tony David Chase in Tony Soprano and vice versa and then I, I it became like this great friendship and he was you know he really trusted uh, you know trusted our, us as a team you know Alan Bob Shaw myself um, Amy the costume designer to to you know bring about his this world that he had created and uh, he was he didn't you know meddle in sort of like this shot or that shot but he was sort of like this this tone master that we would go to you know to make sure that the tone was in the right place and he would just do very slight adjustments of tone but he wasn't you know, out there like saying, why are you doing that shot or something like that. It was more like, you know, really like he was the godfather of the show. And um, it was, uh, I will, you know, never forget that experience. And I, I hope that he does have more stories under his sleeve. Congratulations to both of you. And uh, thanks so much for talking with us about the project. Thank you.